is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Zimbabweans went to the polls on July the 30th, the first time ever in 38 years without former President Robert Mugabe's name on the ballot. With voter turnout at over 70 percent, incumbent President Emerson Munagagwa garnered 50.8 percent over front-running opposition party MDC leader Nelson Chamisa's 44.3 percent. Now, while Munagagwa pledged unity, Chamisa decided to challenge the results in court, citing election fraud and believing his party has won. But whatever the result, the next president of Zimbabwe has his work cut out for him, fixing the economy, creating jobs, and now unifying a divided constituency. All are historical, but all need urgent solutions. So can the elections provide a break with the past? And is Zimbabwe having a new beginning? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. In addition to winning the presidential vote, Munagagwa Zanu PF won a landslide victory in the parliamentary elections. Let's take a look at the country's other poll results and also get some reaction about the just concluded election. The parliamentary election in Zimbabwe saw the ruling ZANU PF party win an overwhelming majority, securing 144 seats over their closest rivals, the MDC Alliance, which won 64 seats. Based on the results released so far by the Zimbabwe Election Commission, ZANU-PF is also likely to win a majority of local government seats as well. Zimbabweans have expressed mixed feelings about the elections. We are very happy. The elections were conducted in a peaceful manner. One of some few disturbances which occurred because of other people who doesn't like to accept defeat. Otherwise, the environment is very conducive. We we'll defend our vote, we we'll defend our voice. We have suffered for long and we are fighting against Some that suffering. We can never allow again the people's victory to be stolen. If there is peace and business starts to build up, it's good for me. But then if there is this hanging thing where we are told the elections were, were rigged and the evidence is not forthcoming, it's confusing. In the meantime, international observers have largely endorsed the vote. Zimbabwe's 2018 harmonized election marked an important moment in the country's democratic transition. We commend the improved political environment and the peaceful and orderly and professional manner in which the elections were administered. China sent a delegation to observe the elections. According to what they observed on the ground, the Zimbabwean people are highly engaged in the elections, which are carried out in a peaceful and orderly manner in general. We have also noted those reports on what happened after the elections and hope that the relevant parties in Zimbabwe will bear in mind the interests of the state and their people and jointly maintain peace, stability and development in Zimbabwe. And joining me to analyze Zimbabwe's elections uh, from Johannesburg, Gideon Chitanga. He's a political analyst at the Center for the Study of Democracy. And with me here in studio, Rishon Chimboza. He's the head of East Africa at the Africa Practice. And Professor Peter Kagwanja, president and CEO of the Africa Policy Institute. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here on Talk Africa. Gideon, in Johannesburg, first to you. Let's start with the election itself. It looked like the most well-organized election in Zimbabwe for the last uh, 38 years. Uh, first, what are your views on the election? process the campaign period was peaceful the voting process was peaceful um, but the old case it reared its ugly head when our results uh, started to filter and then there was uh, a lot of violence in Harare specifically there were issues with the Zimbabwe Election Commission in terms it related to the administrative process and uh, issues around transparent transparency but by and large i think this was a, a peaceful election which reflected 
most cases the will of the Zimbabwean people because the majority of Zimbabweans he managed to vote and they came out in huge numbers. Right, uh, Professor Kagonja, your thoughts? I, I think the Zimbabwean election uh, ref had the reflection of the major uh, characteristics of African elections, one peaceful at the beginning and uh, with the contested results leading to post-election instability. But the good thing about Zimbabwean election is that uh, the post-election instability was short to that extent. And, and it reflects on the principle of, uh, you know, accepting defeat uh, for the losers graciously or uh, basically, um, you know, contesting the results in, in, in court graciously without inside in framing uh, the, the feelings of the public, meaning uh, bring about instability. But as uh, 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 Gideon has said, uh, this election is unique, having observed Zimbabwean elections in the past. This would be characterized as one of the most peaceful, the most orderly, the most organized, and therefore the, re the results would be, to me, fairly credible, and the election generally uh, a, a reflection of the will of the people. Rishan, your thoughts? Mm. I think just uh, looking at these elections, it's important to look at the number of firsts that Zimbabwe recorded. I think if you were to ask anybody in Zimbabwe um, if they thought at the beginning of 2017 that they were going to see someone other than Mugabe on a ballot paper or maybe someone closely affiliated to his close coterie of uh, confidants and uh, 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 erstwhile uh, political commanders, you know, people would be hard pressed to think of who else would have been on that ballot box. Perhaps they would have put forward other names that were being thrown forward that were associated with the G40 cabal, but definitely Munangag was not something that is not somebody who was on people's minds. So I think this was um, a welcome break uh, for a lot of Zimbabweans who were pretty much saying, okay, do you know what? Maybe this is a new start for the country. I think the fact as well that there was a pretty young candidate who had come forward. Right. For the longest time, uh, Zimbabwean politics was characterized by people who had very strong affiliations to the ruling party or either to the trade union movement. So Nelson Chamisa also represented a breath of fresh air on both sides. And I think that's where you see the result was so closely contested because there was a lot of anticipation on what each respected presidential candidate could have brought forward. Gideon Chitanga, though, we saw in past elections that uh, ZANU-PF's campaign did dwell on uh, the liberation struggle, the indigenization, uh, issues of um, land ownership, though. If you look at the message that ZANU-PF was sending today, did that resonate with the people or was that a break from the previous uh, ZANU-PF messages in elections? My, my view is that... Um you know, there, there is a gradualist process of uh, transition within ZANOPF. And uh, I think uh, that transition within ZANOPF is, is not a simple, smooth transition. It, it is also internally contested. Uh, so the process of uh, change, as represented by Mnangagwa, uh, it's a, a gradualist process that is represented that comes out is contested change within the system. And because of that, we have to understand that Mnangagwa or whoever might have emerged within ZANOPF is coming uh, up out of uh, a process of entrenched incumbency. Right. And uh, a lot of things would not suddenly change. So uh, policies, uh, uh, policies practice, practices, norms is practiced under Mugabe would, I think, for a long time persist. But it is a challenge that Mnangagwa is to face in terms of offering the change or the difference, I think, he, that he expects to, to share with the Zimbabweans and the world in terms of uh, his administration. Right. Rishon, uh, in the end, though, uh, what influenced the election outcome? What kind of views or what kind of situations or, or what kind of messages influenced the outcome? This election, the outcome was pretty much based on the expectations of uh, the, the, the electorate. So those within the urban areas, and this is reflected within the voting patterns, by and large, those in the urban areas has, had expectations of better jobs, more economic prosperity, and uh, basically just seeing an improvement in their livelihoods. 
I mean, we shouldn't forget that there's pretty much been two decades of lost growth within Zimbabwe. And this impact has been most felt within the urban areas. So we could see this being reflected by the popularity, more so within, within the Harare district of Nelson Chamisa. Within the rural areas, I think because, uh, number one, ZANU-PF, because of its incumbency, has very strong campaigning structures within the rural areas. And by and large, I think we shouldn't simplify this to a dichotomy of just saying people in rural areas are just given food aid and fertilizer, therefore they'll vote for ZANU-PF. I don't think we should have such a simplistic narrative. I don't think we should take away the ability to be able to create campaigning infrastructure over a three and a half decade period. And there are things that ZANU-PF would be doing right at grassroots level in terms of speaking to the needs of the people in the rural areas. So therefore, for them, there would be a pretty close association. And by and large, the rural people are not a homo homogenous lot. By and large, with the rural population, they yeah. would be seeing ZANU-PF as meeting some of their basic needs as being the party that is best equipped to provide them with that economic prosperity. And with the urban population, for them, it's things that immediately come to mind that they could relate with. So I think the, the, the challenge going forward, I think without uh, trying to undermine um, uh, uh, the, the great work that has been done by the MDC in being able to, to garner votes in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in such a short period of time, right. um, going forward, the most critical thing is how can they put in place structures and infrastructure that will enable them to get down to grassroots level? such that they can get to a stage now where their message is now resonating with the population at large. In terms of resonating, uh, the uh, Electoral Commission noted that 60% of those registered 5.6 million voters, though, were youth. What impact did the youth vote have? Did the youth have a say? The, the youth had a say, and which basically meant that uh, ZANU-PF had to shift its me message, traditional messaging system from appealing to nationalism uh, uh, and also to appeal to the external enemy and, and so on, to now pro giving uh, concrete promises that are going to transform the lives of the youth. And, and long before the election, Mnagagwa started talking about Zimbabwe is open for business, literally saying that uh, this is a new game, uh, there, and there's a new sheriff in town, not the old sheriff. And, and, and that itself began to appeal uh, to the young people. And, and again, as I said, it's, a, it's, it's something that is cutting across the continent, that uh, politicians have to contend with the, uh, with the, the requirements and uh, demands of a, young, a younger and younger generation of people. And therefore, we cannot uh, uh, stick to the old messages. And, and you're going to see in Tanzania, that is going to be the, the issue. You have to change the, the tone. In Mozambique, you've got to change the tone. And I think what, the, 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 what has made Munangagwa emerge as a leader is that he very quickly understood understood uh, the need to shift from the old messages to the new message that appeals to the younger generation. Right. Uh, Gideon, uh, President-elect uh, Munagagwa, though, has pledged unity, but his contender has now gone uh, to court. So what happens next? So I, I think that um, he, he, a promise to unite all Zimbabweans is very critical at this, at this juncture because um, the president-elect Mnangagwa is looking at inheriting a country that is divided, not only a, along partisan lines, but this is a, a country that is divided ethnically. A, this is a country which is divided in terms of economic uh, inequality, socio-economic inequality. And uh, I think by, the, by, give, by offering a promise to unify the country, he is, I hope he is looking at the deeper aspects of how divided this country is. And specifically on dealing with the question of um, uh, his uh, victory being challenged in the courts, I, I guess that this is what the, the law permits. So it does not, uh, it, it is not necessarily an indicator of, um, of uh, division. It's, it's an indicator of discontent. But the problem is the way this whole scenario of uh, a disputation of the results has play, played out and it has taken right. the country back to political polarization. So I would take it that um, the political leaders in all the parties, not only the, the MDC and ZANU-PF, there are other parties which were involved. Uh, they need to keep in touch and dialogue about how they can move the country forward peacefully. That is important. Uh, the idea of unit should also uh, go be, 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 be deepened 
to deal with historical issues that have divided Zimbabweans. Right, uh, Professor, uh, because this view, also um, was a similar case in Kenya as well, where you know the opposition did go to the Supreme Court. So it is becoming uh, quite uh, the norm now in the continent to take your, um, you know, your views to the courts as opposed to the streets. So what mm. happens next now for Zimbabwe? I, I think the, the going to court is very, very important for Zimbabwe because it tests. The, the, the institution, the strength of the institution, how deep is Zimbabwe's democracy? And to see Mnagagwa defend himself in a court of law is very different from calling the ZANU-PF youth to assert their, their, their order. So that's what we're talking about, the newness of, of this whole process. The other thing one might, might quickly say is that uh, the, after the court, uh, Chamisha's wisdom and maturity as a politician is going to be tested on how he's going to, uh, to, uh, to send out an olive branch, accepting the will of the court and also accepting uh, that the Mnagagwa is the leader of Zimbabwe and therefore working as a loyal opposition. Because if he goes to the street, then Zimbabwe will be polarized. Uh, and as it has been said, Zimbabwe is deeply polarized over those years of uh, contestation. Right, uh, gentlemen, we leave it there for the moment. We'll take a short break now, and when we come back, we'll have more on Zimbabwe's new beginning. Stay tuned. China Global Television Network. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms and social media. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now, still with me? From Johannesburg, Gideon Chitanga. He's a political analyst at the Center for the Study of Democracy. And in Nairobi, Rishon Chimboza, head of East Africa at the Africa Practice, and Professor Peter Kagwanja. Let me start off with you, Rishon, here, because whoever is sworn in as president now that uh, the MDC has gone to court, whoever is sworn in as president will have a full entry. What should be of the highest priority agenda? Yeah, so, you know, this entry is going to be bulging. And it's also going to require a very delicate balancing act between, first of all, being able to respond to this court challenge, at the same time being able to regain the confidence of the electorate. Then on the other hand, internationally, you've got Zimbabwe's development partners and you've got international investors. So this entry, it'll have to be a juggling act. So if he were to sequence it, right, number one would be what happens outside the court challenge, right? So fair enough, uh, the legal proceedings have to take uh, due process, right? But people within the opposition, how are they going to be engaged with by the ruling party? Because there's a very short window period for gaining legitimacy after an election. And this legitimacy that is gained, then the rest will then follow the economic confidence, both domestically and internationally. Because brochures alone saying Zimbabwe is open for business are not adequate. They need to, see, they need to have full confidence that if they do invest in Zimbabwe, money can be repatriated right. and their assets will be safe. I want to get your thoughts, Professor. Mm. Mm. I, I think the, the first priority for whoever is declared the winner by the court is to accept the will of the court in order to reinforce the, in, in the centrality of institutions and the need to deepen institutions in Zimbabwe as part of democratic consolidation. That's one. The second is basically to embark on a, an aggressive healing mission, nation healing. Nation healing, not only out of this election, but out of the decades of hemorrhaging of the Zimbabwean uh, nationhood uh, as a result of those contestations. The third and most important is economic uh, you know, uh, recovery. And economic recovery, as uh, my colleague has mentioned here, uh, will have not only to address internal dynamics, right. but also international dynamics. And I think 
uh, Nagagwa has just started this by inviting uh, international observers to come and observe the election as a way of uh, rehabilitating, if I may use that word, Zimbabwe from the isolation, particularly by the West. Uh, and, and, and to me, uh, the, 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 the business is cut. Uh, so Zimbabwe is not just open for business, but has opened its doors for business. Right. Uh, Gideon, your thoughts? I, I totally agree with uh, my two colleagues. He, there is need to quickly work on um, making sure that there is confidence, he, he both economic and political confidence. Uh, there is need to make sure that the institutions um, are not subverted to unnecessary political influence and um, they can regulate e engagements, be it political or economic engagement, so that you you retain that confidence, e especially given the, 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 the historical subversions of uh, uh, e institutions to politics, so wow. that uh, going forward, you at least have a country that is agreeing on the basics in terms of how it can uh, move forward uh, with the transition process. You talked about economic revival and all of you have talked about economic revival as being one of the key uh, the issues though. Over the last uh, six months of uh, President elect Minagago's uh, administration though, how much has changed in terms of Zimbabwe's economy? So what we've uh, seen in Zimbabwe is um, a different coterie of investors, right? The, um, the domestic investors, right, who've been, who've weathered the storm within Zimbabwe. Here we talk about indigenous Zimbabwean businesses who've weathered the storm, who can pretty much see when certain things that they've been through are about to happen again. There's renewed optimism on that front because what they were saying was there's a different uh, cabal who is now um, uh, um, overseeing what is happening within the central bank, a different cabal within the uh, key economic ministries mainly in agriculture, in the mining sector, key sectors for the Zimbabwean economy. So there was a breath of fresh air there because they were saying, right, things could turn out differently. Then internationally, you've got the tire kickers, right? These are people who've uh, literally been sitting by the sidelines and waiting for the situation in Zimbabwe to turn. And when what Zimbabweans choose to call the new dispensation uh, came into power, there was renewed optimism that, right, Here's a president who might be more sympathetic to the needs of businesses. And the first thing that uh, he did that brought a lot of encouragement right. was going on this international mission to try and, number one, uh, show legitimacy and capability of his team, and number two, try and engage with reputable investors. Professor, as uh, Rishan has mentioned there, though, we did see uh, President Munagagwa on several international visits at the World Economic Forum there. What is the future of Zimbabwe, though, in, in, in respect to international relations? Because Zimbabwe has been under sanctions um, for decades now. Uh, I, I think we need to get deeper into that, that uh, within the African circle, Zimbabwe was still uh, seen as, as an icon. Mugabe is still a very respected elder in African politics, however one to want to look at it. So uh, there was a, that ratio aspect to it. So Zimbabwe doesn't have to fight so hard to enter the African terrain. In fact, that's why the removal of Mugabe did not necessarily lead to expulsion of Zimbabwe from the African Union which you normally you see in other countries. So Zimbabwe is very central. Uh, but internally, uh, of course, uh, Zimbabwe uh, you know, was seen uh, by particularly the West as a pariah nation for the reforms that it undertook. Uh, and even before Mugabe uh, was ousted from power, the West had started walking back to Zimbabwe. And we were beginning to talk about uh, re re rehabilitation of Zimbabwe, uh, particularly the G8, G7 and so on. But all through this period, Zimbabwe was remained a darling of the East. China, Singapore, Malaysia, and basically uh, many African countries that uh, were radical, Libya, and uh, Gaddafi, and so on. So in other words, what Munagagwa has now to do is what Mandela did in South Africa. You, con you bring in the West, and you retain the East, and remain African. And therefore, you gain African leadership, you gain uh, international respect, both in the East and the West. It's a high wire to walk, but let's watch how he does it. Right. Uh, Gideon, how important, though, will these partnerships be in rebuilding uh, Zimbabwe? Because as Professor Kagwanja mentioned, uh, Zimbabwe could retain the East, but still reach out to the West. 
Yes, I, I actually think that's one of the most urgent um, issues which should be on the table of the president. And already he, I guess that um, Mr. Mnangagwa realizes that he, hence the idea behind he, inviting the widest he, he membership of the international community to observe the elections and therefore to say Zimbabwe is coming out of a legitimate election. Uh, international partners are needed if Zimbabwe is going to resolve its financial situation and particularly work around reintroducing a domestic currency which will have to be supported externally and domestically for it to attain e, that faith which is needed for a viable currency. E, Zimbabwe needs investors across all its sectors of, the, of its economy. Zimbabwe has great climate. It has a lot of uh, natural uh, resources and commodities. But for the people of Zimbabwe to benefit from these things, you need people who bring in capital, which is not there currently in Zimbabwe. Right. So looking at the last election and, and uh, your comments on uh, over, over the last uh, six months, do, can we say that the election has now uh, symbolized a new beginning for Zimbabwe? For the country itself, certainly. Certainly it is a new beginning. And um, I, I would say that Zimbabwe pretty much right now is a two-speed country. Right, two-speed country in the sense that you're seeing voters predominantly in the urban areas speaking out and saying, this was not our preference. But ultimately what they would want is economic development and economic growth. And if the new team that is ushered in by the uh, president-elect is able to deliver that, I have no shadow of a doubt that a lot of this restless urban population would be able to be turned around and see this as a very positive future for Zimbabwe. So I'll definitely say that, yes, this is a new beginning for the country. Right. Do you see a new beginning here for Zimbabwe, Professor? I think taking the, uh, the history of Zimbabwe in its totality, I think this is a new beginning. But I would see it as a new opportunity for Zimbabwe to reconstruct itself. And the uh, uh, way, uh, right, wide array of uh, opportunities that are presenting themselves, if, uh, just as there are many challenges. One of the challenges, of course, is the divided Zimbabwe. 40, 44 versus 50 is so narrow, that meaning the population is divided in the middle. The healing is one of them. The other thing is the, the goodwill that has begun to come in, and not as a challenge, but as an opportunity, from, particularly from the West, uh, seen in the observation of this election. Zimbabwe should tap into that in order to do this uh, new turn. And eventually, the two leaders are new, both Chamisa and uh, Munagagwa. They don't have old blood, bad blood. Therefore, that to me is an opportunity, and they can uh, reconstruct the, just the, not just the economy, but also the institutions of Zimbabwe and therefore uh, giving Zimbabwe a new lease of life as a democracy. Right. Uh, Gideon Jitanga, final comment from you. Is this now a break with the past for Zimbabwe? Is this a new beginning? I, I just want to say that I do not think that uh, any election, including this one, in itself or by and in itself could actually solve the problems that Zimbabwe are, uh, Zimbabweans are facing. But it only provides a window of opportunity and a kind of a beginning where political leaders and all other players could say, let's work from here and solve uh, the problems in the country. I would uh, say that uh, there is urgent need for, for dialogue in Zimbabwe. So including the problems that we have seen associated with these uh, elections could be effected into a process of dialogue so that there is a, 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 a true a uh, new dispensation which is broadly inclusive and considers a lot of other sectors and players in dealing with the, the current problems. All right, uh, Gideon Chitanga, uh, Rishan and Professor Kagwanja, thank you very much for joining us on the program. That's all we have time for this week, but thank you to my guests for their insights. Gideon Chitanga from Johannesburg, he's a political analyst at the Center for the Study of Democracy. And in Nairobi, Rishan Chimboza, head of East Africa at the Africa Practice. And Peter Kagwanja, President and CEO of the Africa Policy Institute. Remember, we'd love to hear your feedback through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. You can also catch the show on YouTube playlist to keep the conversation going and tune in again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall and the team in Nairobi, goodbye.